So begins the final act of Jesus' life in John's Gospel. Our passage comes from the 12th chapter of his Gospel, where virtually the entire cast of characters in the human family makes an appearance. His disciples are there along with a large crowd of Jews. The chief priests and leaders of the people show their faces among the great throng that had come to worship at the Passover feast. And then the Greeks show up. And this is strange because Greeks are Gentiles, they're non-Jews. And they're coming to Jerusalem, as the Gospel says, to worship at the Jewish feast of Passover. So the gang's all there. All of humanity is symbolically represented and gathered in Jerusalem. And Jesus finally says, rather abruptly, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Everything, we have to understand, everything in John's Gospel is leading up to this point. It's been leading up to this moment, to the hour of Jesus. I'm reminded of what often happens when someone is at the end of life. It's amazing how often the person who is actively dying won't let go until their last child has arrived. And that's what happens here. Jesus waits until the Greeks have arrived, the last of the human family, even if they appear as red-headed stepchildren rushing in at the last minute. He waits until they enter the hospice ward of Jerusalem in order to begin his dying process. And in the next seven chapters of John's Gospel, Jesus will spend his time doing what any loved one would do for those they love. He tells them the most essential things the things he wants them to remember. And the first essential thing that Jesus says to the human family is that your life will bear fruit only if you are willing to put it in the hands of another. Only if you are willing to lose it in the life of another. And in many ways, this takes us back to the beginning of John's Gospel, when Jesus says to John and Andrew, what are you looking for? It's the first first words that come out of Jesus' mouth in John's Gospel. What are you looking for? Are you looking for something that will just entertain you for a little while? Are you looking for someone to get you out of work? Are you looking for a reason to get away from your wife? Are you looking for someone to tell you how to live your life? What are you looking for? And it's an important question for us now. It's a question that we can't skip over. Because if we don't know what we're looking for, if we're not certain that this is our path to happiness, if we've just kind of been along for the ride on this traveling Jesus show, kind of tanning ourselves in the spotlight that had been shining on Jesus, then we will not be able to withstand the events that are to come in the life of Jesus. What are you looking for? What are you looking for, and how much do you want it? Oddly enough, it's the Greeks, the last to arrive at the bedside, who put this question back in front of us by saying to Philip, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And what about for us? Do we want to see Jesus? Not just in His glory, not just in His power, but in His weakness. Do we want to see Him when He is beaten down, when He's crowned by thorns, when He's stripped of His garments, when He's nailed to a tree? Do we want to see Jesus in the faces of the lowly and the poor, 
Do we want to see him in the family member that is struggling, in the friend that is wrestling with depression? Do we want to see Jesus in the faces of people that we don't like? How much do we want to see the face of Jesus? Do we want to see him in the way that he chooses to appear to us or only in the way that we want to see him? Jesus comes to put in front of us in a very stark way the effects of our sin, as if to say to us, this is what happens. This is what happens when you don't allow your life to find meaning in me. This is what happens when you try and live for yourself. This is what happens. This is what I have to do for you. If you are not willing to give yourself to me. I have to give myself to you. And this is what he does. Jesus hands himself over to humanity because humanity will not hand itself over to him. How much does the Lord love us? How much does God want us for himself? How much does God want to forgive our sins? I don't know what's in your heart. I don't know what you're wrestling with. I don't know what sin maybe is weighing down on you and and causing you guilt and shame. I don't know what's in there. But whatever it is, God's mercy is greater. There is nothing that God cannot forgive. There is nothing that God has not come to wipe away so that we can be alive, so that we can appreciate the beauty of this world. God is more powerful than all of it. And this is why he has come to save us from these things, from the ways that we fall, from the ways that we turn away, from the ways that we resist the Lord who comes to us again and again in his mercy. This is how God accomplishes unity with us. By taking on himself the effects of our betrayal and forgetfulness. As the prophet Jeremiah says in that first reading, all from least to greatest shall know me, says the Lord, for I will forgive their evil doing and remember their sin no more. We know what he's done. It's no secret. We know how far Jesus has traveled for us. We know the commitment that he has made to our salvation. Now, it's a question of how we will respond. What are you looking for? Do you want to see Jesus? How much are you willing to sacrifice to be one with Him?